above the rugged peaks of the Owen Stanley Mountains in southeastern New Guinea, United States transport planes keep open an aerial supply line to Australian and American troops now taking the offensive against the Japanese. Native Papuan villagers stand in awe of the giant friendly transports that swoop in dropping food and supplies from the sky. Supplies that take six days to come by land, 20 minutes by air. pictures of war as it's fought in the jungle. Loyal natives, intrepid airmen, battling and overcoming the wilderness as well as the Japs. A clean rifle may mean life or death in the jungle. And these are the Australians that defeated the Japs at Kokoda. Now, over trails never traveled by whites, they follow up the attack. Soldiers skilled in all the tricks of jungle warfare. With field mortars and Tommy guns, they blast away at the slightest sound. Veterans return from the front for a short and well-earned rest at an advance outpost. The devotion of New Guinea natives to the Allied cause has been a tremendous advantage. Toiling over rough mountain paths, carriers bring back the wounded over a terrain no motor car could ever penetrate. Vividly, dramatically, these scenes bring home a picture of the incredible odds against which the United Nations forces are fighting and winning in the South Pacific. Field hospitals care for minor casualties. Most ask only for a cigarette and a chance to return to the fight. under the command of Australia's General Sir Thomas Blamey, men under the leadership of America's great General Douglas MacArthur. These veterans are among the best fighters in the world. This soldier is thankful he was wearing his tin hat. Here, upon Australia's first line of defense, it rains almost constantly, yet even in the heaviest downpour, they push on through ankle-deep mud. Only 100 miles from the mainland, they're keeping the Japs on the move. Strategic spearhead of the United Nations offensive in the South Pacific. Washington, D.C., the Joint Allied War Council in session. Marshall, U.S. Army Chief of Staff. Arnold, Chief of the Air Forces. Admiral Leahy, second only to President Roosevelt. King directing the Navy. With British and other United Nations warheads, these men lifted the curtain on America's dramatic invasion of North Africa. Opening gun in the offensive to drive Hitler from the continent of Europe. The new theater of war, from Suez to Gibraltar, down the Atlantic to Casablanca, Africa's entire Mediterranean coast, Morocco, Tunisia, Libya. From Egypt, British and American planes launched the first phase of a broad and well-timed attack. Relentlessly, bombers blasted supply lines of the Nazi Rommel's veteran Africa Corps. Then, seasoned British Imperials and Colonials their ranks augmented with French American reinforcements and American tanks blazed across the desert in pursuit. Rommel was in retreat. 
Axis prisoners on the road back. For miles, columns of Rommel's shattered army streamed to the rear. Entire divisions of battalions abandoned by the Nazis as they fled. Timing the blow with the rout of the main Axis African force, America's General Eisenhower moved to take over French North Africa. Directing the air arm, Doolittle, leader of United States raids on Tokyo. From the White House, President Roosevelt made history with a momentous announcement, assuring Frenchmen that America is fighting their enemy. His message in French was broadcast by shortwave. Nous arrivons parmi vous seulement pour écraser et pour anéantir vos ennemis. Croyez-nous bien. Nous ne voulons vous faire aucun mal. Rendez-vous concours où vous pouvez, mes amis, et nous voulons revenir le jour glorieux quand la liberté et la paix régneront de nouveau dans le monde. Vive la France éternelle! Starved and bleeding France well remembers America's shiploads of mercy. To the children of France, the United States has always been their friend. For even while France was being bled white by her German conquerors, the children of Vichy were fed free food and milk from their friends in the United States. This, France will never forget. From Gibraltar, United Nations rendezvous, came news of America's first great liberating stroke. Nazi Germany noted with grave concern the concentration of a powerful allied striking force. Then from across the water came a convoy of ships such as the world has never seen. Transports and warcraft comprising the greatest amphibious operation in all history. Landings followed a formula Americans have well perfected. Like the Marines in their latest invasion drill, assault boats lead the way. Tanks rolled ashore under their own power. To Americans who had rehearsed it a hundred times, the real invasion was just like their drill. Algiers, Mediterranean key to French North Africa, was showered from the air with leaflets calling on the people to aid the Americans in the fight against the common foe. After a token defense, armed resistance ceased. Oran was encircled. Casablanca fell. Crack units of French colonials, Arabs, Berbers, Senegalese, pledged allegiance to France's great general Henri Giraud when he landed in Africa after his escape from the Nazis. Under brave General Giraud, France's African legions have within their power the greatest opportunity of the war to strike a decisive blow for the freedom of France. With General Charles de Gaulle, French patriots are fighting at sea, on land and in the air. He summons his countrymen. Rise, every one of you. Help our allies. The great hour of liberation has come. <laughs> 